Section 20 In my condemnation of Christianity, I surely hope I do no injustice to a related religion with an even larger number of believers. I allude to Buddhism. Both are to be reckoned among the nihilistic religions. They are both decadence religions, but they are separated from each other in a very remarkable way. For the fact that he is able to compare them at all, the critic of Christianity is indebted to the scholars of India. Buddhism is a hundred times as realistic as Christianity. It is part of its living heritage that it is able to face problems objectively and coolly. It is the product of long centuries of philosophical speculation. The concept God was already disposed of before it appeared. Buddhism is the only genuinely positive religion to be encountered in history, and this applies even to its epistemology, which is a strict phenomenalism. It does not speak of a struggle with sin, but yielding to reality of the struggle with suffering. Sharply differentiating itself from Christianity, it puts the self-deception that lies in moral concepts behind it. It is, in my phrase, beyond good and evil. The two physiological facts upon which it grounds itself, and upon which it bestows its chief attention, are first, an excessive sensitiveness to sensation, which manifests itself as a refined susceptibility to pain, and secondly, an extraordinary spirituality a too protracted concern with concepts and logical procedures under the influence of which the instinct of personality has yielded to a notion of the impersonal. Both of these states will be familiar to a few of my readers, the objectivists, by experience, as they are to me. These physiological states produced a depression, and Buddha tried to combat it by hygienic measures. Against it, he prescribed a life in the open, a life of travel, moderation in eating, and a careful selection of foods, caution in the use of intoxicants, the same caution in arousing any of the passions that foster a bilious habit and heat the blood. Finally, no worry, either on one's own account or on the account of others. He encourages ideas that make for either quiet contentment or good cheer. He finds means to combat ideas of other sorts. He understands good, the state of goodness, as something which promotes health. Prayer is not included, and neither is asceticism. There is no categorical imperative, nor any disciplines, even within the walls of a monastery. It is always possible to leave. These things would have been simply means of increasing the excessive sensitiveness above mentioned. For the same reason, he does not advocate any conflict with unbelievers. His teaching is antagonistic to nothing so much as revenge, aversion, Resentiment, enmity never brings an end to enmity, the moving refrain of all Buddhism. And in all this he was right, for it is precisely these passions which, in view of his main regiminal purpose, are unhealthful. The mental fatigue that he observes, already plainly displayed in too much objectivity, that is, in the individual's loss of interest in himself, in loss of balance and of egoism, he combats by strong efforts to lead even the spiritual interests back to the ego. In Buddha's teaching, egoism is a duty. The one thing needful, the question how you can be delivered from suffering, regulates and determines the whole spiritual diet. Perhaps one will here recall that Athenian who also declared war on pure scientificality, to wit Socrates, who also elevated egoism to the estate of a morality.